Father, we're grateful that we can just bring everything before you. And Lord, I'm grateful that we don't have any huge needs in our church right now. We thank you that people are doing fairly well. But Lord, I know there are a lot of people that are still hurting physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, in all those areas. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you and our community. And I pray that we would be a light to our community in how we live individually and how we live as a church. And Father, I do pray that you would provide the leadership for us to be able to provide a good news club for the children in our community. Lord, uh, as you say in your word early in chapter 10, how will they hear if no one tells them? And so, Lord, we need to be reaching our community with the gospel and help us, Lord, to be able to do that. And Lord, as we look at your word again today, help us, Lord, to understand what you're trying to teach us, not just about Israel, but about ourselves and how we're to live. And Lord, just guide my words as I speak and help us to hear what you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it is, uh, as I was thinking about today's sermon, we've been in Romans chapter 9 through 11 for quite a few weeks now, talking about Israel. And there is one sense where there's a curiosity of saying, well, what about Israel? But the other part is, what is the practical application for you and I today? And I think it's really important when we look at all of God's Word Again, it's no different than the Old Testament. When we read and study the Old Testament, they're not the Jewish scriptures. They're our scriptures. Because we are a part of God's children. And we're going to see that today, that we have been grafted in to Abraham's family by faith in Christ. So when we look at the application, and we look at what Paul is teaching here about the Jews, we need to remember that they're no different than us. Human is human. And where they struggle with rebellion and unbelief, we can struggle with unbelief and rebellion. I'm going to talk about that today. But I think it's also important to go back to the reason I believe that Paul put this in here in chapter 9 through 11. And the two main reasons that we looked at was, first of all, if God didn't keep His promises to Israel, there's no guarantee He'll keep His promises to us. So Paul is here teaching us and showing how God has kept His promises, and he uses the Old Testament over and over and over again to show it. The second one is, and this is going to become a pivotal point in today's sermon, where as Gentiles, how we treat the Jews, and all those outside the faith has a lot to do with the genuine, whether our faith is genuine or not. And Paul gives a dire warning in this passage dealing with how we look at others, especially the Jews. And that has been a problem throughout church history where often you see the church looking down or even uh, persecuting the Jews uh, throughout history. The world has persecuted the Jews and will continue to do that. That's their curse from God. But the church is never to be a part of that. We are to love the Jewish people and to embrace them and seek to lead them to the Lord. So we looked at the end of chapter 10 where Paul showed that the Jews had rejected the gospel and it wasn't because of not hearing it or understanding it, but because of a stubborn and rebellious spirit that rejected their Messiah. And Paul ended chapter 10 by saying, But regarding Israel, God said, All day long I opened my arms to them, but they were, they were disobedient and rebellious. Starting chapter 11, then Paul asked another question, which again, he's asked questions throughout the book of Romans, 
And he prefaces what he's going to be teaching by the questions. And he said in chapter 1 regarding, uh, in chapter 11 verse 1 regarding Israel, I asked then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? And he says, of course not. And he uses two examples that we looked at last week to show how he hadn't rejected them. The first one was Paul himself when he said, I am, I myself an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And again, Paul's own personal testimony shows that God has not rejected the Jews. There was nobody that was more violently persecuting the church and unbelieving of Jesus Christ as the Messiah than Paul. Yet God miraculously saved him. He converted to Christianity, and that is a picture of what will happen at the end of the age when Christ appears and the Jews as a nation, we're going to look at that next week, will be saved and come to Christ. And so his own testimony says, no, God has not rejected Jews because I'm saved. And I was as rebellious and undeserving as anybody alive. But he also looks at another Old Testament illustration of Elijah. And he said in verse 2 and 3, No, God has not rejected His own people, whom He chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the Scriptures say about this? Elijah the prophet complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, You have killed, down your, pro you have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And again, as we mentioned last week, Elijah was a prophet to Israel during the reign of Ahab, who was very likely and was the worst king Israel ever had. Him and his wife had led Israel into the worship of Asherah and Baal, and they had destroyed the altars, they had killed the prophets, and Elijah stood up to them. After a three-year drought, Elijah challenged the prophets of Asherah and Baal on the Mount Carmel. And after showing that God was the one true God, they were all killed. And Jezebel said, I am going to wipe you out. I am going to kill you. It was her vow to get Elijah. And Elijah fled from, from Jezebel, which is kind of funny, in my opinion. He just killed 850 prophets on the mountain and flees from this wicked woman and runs away. And he runs away all the way into Sinai, into the desert, and he lay down as he wants to die. He's depressed, he's tired, he just wants to die. But God fed him there, an angel came and fed him, and after he's revived and rested, God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, God, and this is where he says this, Lord, they killed all your prophets. I'm the only one left. It's all just me. You know, woe is me. I'm all by myself. By the way, do you ever feel that way? Again, the application for all of us. Because there are times when we feel, I'm all alone. It's just me. And Paul tells us, and God reminded uh, Elijah that, no, that's not true. He said, I have... 7,000 others who have never let bowed to Baal. Now again, I mentioned this last week, 7,000 people was a very small remnant of the nation of Israel. There was over a million people in the nation of Israel at this time. So 7,000 is not a very large population, but it was a lot more than one, wasn't it? God always keeps His remnant. And that's His point here. And He says that in the next uh, two verses where he says in verse 5 and 6, it is the same today as if for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, His undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So what Paul is saying here is that God has always kept and will always keep a remnant of believing Jews among God's family. And that's the case then. There was, will always be that. And he says that in verse 7. So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they're looking for so earnestly. A few have, 
the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. Now again, uh, Emily, you, you tend to hit a point in every one of my sermons with your reading. But again, it doesn't say that God hardened their hearts. They hardened themselves, and God rejected them. And so there's, there is this principle that we look at, and I talked about it last week, and it's the paradox. And it was the main point in the sermon last week. And that is that God chooses some people for salvation. He chooses some to be saved. But no one deserves it. The rest of the people harden their hearts against God's grace. In other words, they're not excusable because they're not saved. They have chosen to harden their hearts against the Messiah, the truth, the gospel of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. They make that choice. And so I believe that, as I mentioned last week, when you look at salvation, there's a sign that reads, everyone who wants to come and receive the life of God, come and receive it. But when you do receive Christ, and you look back on it, you realize and you see how God orchestrated your salvation, and it was all God's work. And that's a big point we're going to look at today in our sermon as Paul continues on. We concluded last week with verse 10, which again leads to another question that we're going to look at today. Paul says this about the Jews. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see and let their backs be bent forever. And again, I mentioned last week that he's talking about the present state of the Jews and their backs being bent has to do with being in bondage to the law. They are in an idea of slavery, backs bent, because they're in bondage to this law that they can never keep and they're trying to so terribly. But the other thing I mentioned last week, that forever is a bad translation. A lot of the translations have it. But the word is better translated in this context is continually. And we find that in the next part, as Paul asks the next question, we see where it's not a forever issue. And Paul asks the question again, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? And again, he says, of course not. Now here he is speaking not of individual Jews, the remnant. He's already answered that question. He is now talking about the nation of Israel. Is there any hope for the nation of Israel? Have they stumbled forever beyond help? And again, if you look at the history of Israel, it is dismal for the most part. From the very founding of the nation, coming out of Egypt, so after the conquest and throughout their history for uh, almost a thousand years before they are uh, taken into captivity for Judah, for Israel, it was less. And then afterwards to the time of Jesus and now even in Paul's day where he's talking, within a, just within a decade, the nation of Israel is going to be, well, a decade and a half, the, the nation of Israel is going to be wiped off the face of the world and their Jerusalem is going to be annihilated, wiped out. So Paul is asking, is there any hope for the nation of Israel as a whole? And he says, absolutely, yes, there is. There is hope for the nation, and God will work. But it's interesting how he answers the question next, and he turns to the Gentiles to explain how this will come about, which is interesting. In verse 11b, it says this. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But He wanted His own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. That's an interesting way to answer the question of why God's not through with Israel. But it plays into the sovereignty of God. And here's the point. That God's destruction of Israel and the hardening of Israel is ultimately about God's grace of opening up the gospel for everyone to benefit from it. 
See, here's the thing. If all of the of Jews had embraced the gospel from the very beginning, the Jewish church would have been the mother church, which it was for a while. But remember, even in the back book of Acts, within 15 years of the beginning of the church, the church had already moved its main center of activity from Jerusalem to Antioch in Caesarea. That was the mission-sending place. Yeah, Jerusalem was still important, but you see it waning by the time of Paul writing Romans. He goes back, but again in 70 A.D., and somebody asked me this last week, and I went and researched it and made sure I was correct on my answer. Somebody asked, in 70 A.D. when Rome uh, destroyed Jerusalem, what about the Christians in Jerusalem? You know what the answer was? Josephus says they weren't there. They fled. They took Jesus' words uh, when he talked about the, uh, the last discourse. They fled. When he said, when you see this happening, when they siege Jerusalem, go flee to the mountains. Don't go to Jerusalem. And a lot of the Jews went to Jerusalem, ended up in the siege, and ended up dying. But the Christians fled to the mountains. So the Jerusalem church ceased to be. But see, if the Jews had embraced the gospel fully, completely, you and I would have had to go through the Jewish church to be saved, just like in the old Mosaic law. Gentiles were always accepted into God's people. But you had to go through the Jews to get there. And it was not God's plan for the Jews to be the ones in charge of the church. It was open to everyone with equal standing. And that's the key. It's not that the, the gospel wouldn't have gone out, but we would not have been of equal standing with the Jews had the Jews all embraced it. And that's what Paul is saying here in part, is that because of the Jewish rejection, the doors were flung open for the Gentiles to come into the church and to have equal standing, which we see at the end of the book of Acts. And by the time Paul is writing this to Rome, the church is made up of primarily Gentiles with Jews in it, and the leadership of the church is not all Jewish. It is a mix. But he also further states this, that he desires for the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous and want what we have. Now most of the time when you see the word jealousy, it's always in a negative, in, in, uh, a negative uh, connotation because it's based on covetousness. And there are some translations that use the word envy, which is another form of jealousy. But the idea is, he wants to use this in a positive way, that as the Jews look at the Gentiles, he does, they desire to have what the Gentiles have. Now what is it that we have that a Jew should desire to have? And it is that personal relationship with Christ, with God Himself, where we don't have to walk in fear and anxiety, but we can have peace and joy in the midst of trouble. By the way, I want to challenge us. In the messed up world we're in, are we just as anxious and troubled about the world as the rest of the world? We shouldn't be. We know what the final score is going to be. We know who wins. Why are we so anxious about the things going on in the world? We shouldn't be. And that should be one of the things that attracts people to us. Along with that, a lack of fear of death. We should never fear death as believers in Christ. It's an unpleasant experience we're going to go through. I'm not, it's still an enemy. But I'm not afraid to die. And I see when I'm in the, in the hospital with people who are dying, I see people and I know a distinct difference between those that are Christians and those that are not. There is a peace and a joy in the midst of tragedy as believers in Christ that others do not have. Along with that, we have the ability to forgive others. 
which the world doesn't. And again, that's a gift that God gives us, the ability to do it. And we talked about this before, that we can forgive truly from the heart and restore relationships. And that's been one of the blessings that I've seen over the last few years. After the big mess we had in the church a few years ago, of being able to restore many of those relationships with people that left the church. Because God is a God that forgives. And we are to be like that. We do not have to be bitter. We don't have to be angry. We also have the ability to be generous, not selfish. We should be a very generous people. Giving and not self-centered. And serving others rather than serving ourselves. Again, these are qualities of Christianity that God has given us. And we should have that. Jesus said this regarding His followers. He said in John 13, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are My disciples. It's not a perfect doctrine. It's not a perfect teaching. It's not our tithing. It's not our nice buildings. It's none of that. It's our love for one another that is going to be the attractant for people to want what we have when we love others. And that is only possible when we allow God to work in us. So we need to ask our question, does my life as a Christian make others envy me and desire to become a Christian? You know, I would say in the political climate in the world we're living in America, that's not very true because we have, we have become polemical and we've become political. And that doesn't attract anybody. That just makes more fighting going on. But see, as we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, and we love people and live by the power of the Holy Spirit, people will be attracted to us. And again, to remind us what that is, Galatians 5 says this, this is the way we should live. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when people think about you, wherever they are, in the schools, in the workplace, in the community, and they think about you or they think about me and they said, wonder what kind of person Randall is. Do these kind of qualities come out? Do they say, oh, he lo he's a peace lover. He's full of joy. He's patient with others. He's kind to all people. He's good. He's faithful. He's gentle. He has self-control. See, if those things are not being exhibited in my life, am I really attracting others to the Lord? And that's what Paul is challenging the Gentile Christians to be in the face of the Jews who are persecuting them. Remember that. The Jews are not just persecuting Paul, they're persecuting the church. And they are, they are producing these, or they're supposed to be producing these qualities that would make the Jews jealous and want to be saved. Paul goes on to speak further about Israel who will eventually accept Christ as their Savior. Look at what verse 12 he says. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because of the people of Israel, because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much a greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. Now again, Paul is now looking at the future, at the end of the age, when Israel will be saved. And what he's saying is, if we have been enriched because Israel fell away, how much more will it happen when Israel's saved? And what he's doing is, he's making the argument from the lesser to the greater. If, because Israel rejected the gospel, the Gentiles came flooding in, then when Israel accepts the gospel, how much greater will the world be then at that point? And again, he has been, Paul has been talking about Israel again for now two and a half chapters. 
And he's been talking in general about Israel. But again, who's his primary audience? It's been the Gentiles. But now he specifically points out the Gentiles in the church in Rome in the next two verses. And he says this, I am saying all this especially for you Gentiles. In other words, you Gentiles, listen up. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this, for I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. So Paul is addressing the Gentiles in the church. And he said, I have been appointed as an apostle to the Gentiles. But guess what? That is not lessen my desire in my heart for my fellow countrymen. I want them to be saved. You know, it's like a foreign missionary. Uh, we had Joe come and speak here uh, a month or two ago. And when Joe came and spoke, he talked about his heart for the Ukraine. But if you also heard him speaking, you talked about his heart for America and the church in America. That's his mission field is Ukraine. And he'll probably spend the rest of his life there, God willing. But he has not forgotten his own country and his own country people. And that's the way Paul was. He was an apostle of the Gentiles. And what a blessing he is to the Gentiles. I mean, the doors were opened and Paul was responsible for a lot of the Gentile church coming to be. And he wrote books in the New Testament and he stopped the Judaism and the Jewish church from imposing the law upon the church. What a great blessing he was. But he is challenging the Gentiles to live such a life that the Jews will come to know the Lord. See, here's the thing. Is our life a hindrance from people being able to be saved? I remember a preacher talking about this 30 years ago. And he was walking his community and praying for his community. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I don't want people here to know you're a Christian. And what was the implication? He wasn't living a life that was attracting people to the gospel. And again, I think in our day and time, one of the most important things is, is we've got to change our priorities. Our priorities are just like the world's in most cases. And our goal, the goal of our life, the primary goal of everything we do, should be to love others into the kingdom of God. Next slide, please. That should be the goal. What do you want to accomplish in 2023? Lead others to Christ. What do you want to accomplish 10 years from now? Lead others to Christ. And we do that by how we live. It doesn't mean it's our profession. That doesn't mean you're going to necessarily become a missionary and go off around the world. It might be. But what it means is that in every relationship we have, in everything we do, we want to exhibit Christ. So people will be wanting what we have. And that's what Paul is challenging the church with here. Paul now affirms the previous statement he made to emphasize what this means for Israel. Look at verse 15. For since their rejection talking about Israel, meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world. Their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead. And I think Paul is now speaking in generalities. He's speaking about individual Jews that he wants to lead to Christ. But he's also speaking about his desire to see his countrymen saved. Which he knows will not happen in his lifetime. But again, he's looking at it from the perspective, like every believer, it will be life from the dead. It's a resurrection. 
And can't we all say that when we were saved, there was a sense where we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and now we have become alive? He uses two illustrations in the next part of the passage and really goes through the rest of this passage to illustrate God's promises to Israel, but also for all who believe. And he looks at this from Abraham and goes back to the root in Abraham. Look at verse 16, the first part. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, and I want to define holy here. What holy is meaning here is set apart, dedicated to God, pure and holy. Those are general ways of looking at holy. God is holy. He's perfect in everything He does. He is set apart different from everything else in the universe. And if we are holy, we are set apart and dedicated to God, and we are to live whole, pure and good lives. And Paul is saying here that because Abraham was set apart and the patriarchs were set apart as holy, dedicated to God, and made pure by God, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. And so what Paul is saying, that Abraham, because he was holy, the nation of Israel was set apart to be holy. And therefore, Abraham's descendants had those that accepted Christ, and we're going to see it in the next verse, were holy and dedicated as part of Abraham and who he is. But he, and he used the illustration here in this passage of the first fruits that were taken from the land. Look at what Numbers 15 says when he talks about these, the lump of dough. He said, when you arrive in the land where I'm taking you and you eat the crops that grow there, you must set aside some sacred offering to the Lord. Present a cake from the first of the flour you grind and set it aside as sacred offering as you do with the first grain from the threshing floor. And what this principle is, it's the first fruits. It's like the tithe. When you set apart this portion, it makes all the rest of it holy and dedicated before the Lord as well. And that was the principle of the first fruits. And that's what Paul is saying here. Because Abraham was holy, the nation was considered holy. But again, not all of it was holy. Because we look at the second illustration, and as Paul goes through this, through the rest of this passage, we see where not everyone was holy. Look at, number, at, at Romans 16, 11, 16 again. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. Paul now is saying Abraham is the root of the tree. And the tree is Israel, and it's holy because Abraham, the root of that tree, was holy. But he explains about the branches next. And this is where he gets into the teaching about the present day church. Look at what he says. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. Now again, think of the tree. And I read this morning about the vine and the branches in John 15, where he talks about the vine, those that don't produce fruit are broken off and burned. Well, the Israelites who did not believe were broken off. And so they were no longer a part of the tree. And look at what he says next regarding that and the Gentiles. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. Again, all of us as Gentiles come from a wild olive tree. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that we were without God, we were without hope, 
we didn't have the law. <coughs> we didn't <coughs> have the things that God gave Israel through Abraham and through Moses. But we have been grafted into the tree. So these wild olive branches have been plucked out of the wild olive tree and pushed into and grafted in to Abraham's tree. And now we are part of Abraham's tree. And so through faith, and this is something we need to look at the tree now. How does Abraham's tree look right now? It is made up of Jews who are believers in Christ and Gentiles who are believers in Christ. With equal standing within that tree, there's not a distinction. And that's what Paul is teaching here. But he also uses this illustration, and this is where it comes to bear on us right now, as a warning for us. And unfortunately, I don't think the church heeds this very well. And it hasn't throughout history. But here's the warning that Paul gives out in starting with verse 18. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch, not the root. And there are several implications to this. First of all, we should be grateful for our Jewish heritage. I've talked about this before. In 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul talks about the people in the desert, and they were coming out for 40 years, he said, don't be like your ancestors. He's talking to the Gentile church. See, our ancestry, because we have been grafted into the tree, we are, in our ancestry, the Israelites, the believing remnant of Israel. And so we are never to look down on our brothers in that sense, our ancestors and the Jews. God graciously grafted us in. You're not just a branch, you're just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Do you see the arrogance that's pushing from that? And then Paul comes back and says, yes. But remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you did believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen if God did not spare the original branches, He won't spare you either. Again, stubborn, rebellious, unbelieving Jews were broken off from the tree. And Paul is warning the same will happen to stubborn, unrebellious, unbelieving Gentiles. You see, there's never a place for pride or looking down on any unbeliever, Jew or otherwise. We're all saved by grace. And God speaks to this in detail in another passage that I want to share with you. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, what Paul says. Again, we're familiar with the first couple of verses here. He said, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Again, that's what Paul's been saying in this passage. We have nothing to boast about. Then jumping forward to verse 11, he said, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be the outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from the citizenship of the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promise that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Lest we forget, we were without God and without with hope. But Paul concludes and says, But now you have been united with Jesus Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. And again, Paul in this passage is emphasizing salvation. That's by God's grace. And him grafting us into God's family 
forever in his tree. But he speaks of the unbelieving, proud Jews, even in Ephesians, who were self-reliant. What were they trusting in? Their circumcision. Keeping the law. See, they were not depending on God. And again, we were without God and without hope. And every person is saved by grace. And we are fully relying on God's mercy every moment. You see, there's never a place for self-confidence or pride in our lives. And just as the Jews were cut off from Christ because of unbelief, so will that happen if we become self-reliant as the Jews did. And as I was thinking and working through this, I feel like in part that has already happened. The Western church, which is Europe and North America and Australia and New Zealand, the Western church has fallen completely away in so many places. There's only a remnant left. Again, when I was in seminary 30 years ago, they talked about we were about 30, 40 years behind Europe and how the church in Europe had died. And it is. There's not very much of a church left in Europe. They have made hotels and houses out of a lot of the cathedrals. They've sold them. They no longer exist. Sound familiar? America today, we are closing the doors of churches every week. Why is that? I think it is because of self-reliance and pride. Paul warned us in Corinthians about this. He said, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. I think there is a tendency in our lives to think we've got this. You know, I know a lot of men are this way. This is not my notes. But we're about conquest. You know, when we are dating our wives and we are pursuing them, we are about conquest. But then we're married and we move on to something else. You know, we're out hunting. You know, there's a lot of guys hunting right now. This is hunting season. They're out to conquer. They've got to kill the beast. You know, they've got their, their arrows or whatever they're using. and got to go out and conquer that beast. Same with professions. We want to work our way up to the top of the totem pole. And then we move on to something else. And I think there is a tendency within us and I think it's one of the complacencies that we see in the church today. Well, I've got that Christianity thing down. Okay, now I need to pursue something else. That is the one thing that will cause our doom. And I think that's a lot of the doom we see in America. Again, the goal of men, if you look at the last generation, was not to build the church. It has been to pursue their careers, to build their families, to build their homes. And those things are not bad. But they become idols because they can become more important than the church. And that should be our primary goal is to continue to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ and to continue to serve Him till we take our last breath. And that is the, the challenge that's before us in that. So Paul kind of puts this all together in the next three verses as I close this morning. Look what he says. Notice how God is both kind and severe. You know, there's a tendency to look at God either one or the other, isn't there? Again, what Emily said this morning, that hard teaching brings soft hearts. And hard teaching brings, or soft teaching brings hard hearts. I think that when you champion just on God's kindness, which a lot of people do, you get hard hearts. I can do anything I want. I don't have to be in church. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to follow Jesus. I can do anything I want. That's soft teaching that brings hard hearts. But the other side is, the hard teaching, the severity, if we only champion on 
severity, which church has tendency to do. You darn you right and sit here, you're going to hell. You know, all that stuff. And you can't do this, and you can't do that. And, and it's all about rules and regulations, and we just see, you know, God's going to get you for that. That mentality will bring hard, will not work either. We've got to keep that balance of God's kindness and His severity. And He clarifies this. He is severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in His kindness. By the way, do you notice the difference? He doesn't say He's kind if we continue to obey. What does He say? If we continue to trust. But if you stop trusting, you will be cut off. Again, I'm reminded of what Jesus said in, in John 6, where the crowd came to Him and said, what must we do to inherit eternal life? What must we do? Remember what Jesus' answer was? Believe in me. That's the do. See, disobedience is to rebel against God's truth and not to receive Christ as Savior. And God is kind to all those who surrender to Him and trust Him. Again, there's no pride and no self-reliance in that, is there? He goes on and says in verse 23, And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. Again, Paul is amplifying the kindness of God. He is eager to graft them back into the tree. This goes back to what he said at the end of chapter 10. God's arms are wide open. It's wide open to the Jews. It's open to the Gentiles. It's open to all people who will believe. He then concludes, and this is where we're going to conclude today, verse 24, with the following passage where he says this. And again, this is speaking to us Gentiles. You, by nature, were a branch cut off from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into His cultivated tree, He will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. Again, going back to the wild, wild olive tree, there's never a place for pride or looking down on others because we're saved. Paul has used an unnatural illustration of horticulture. How many have ever grafted branches of one tree into another one? A fruit tree. Has anybody here done it? I've never done it. Rob, you've done it. Well, what you do is you take a good branch from a good cultivated tree and you graft it into a wild tree to make good fruit. You don't do the opposite. You don't take the wild branch and put it in the good branch because it's going to produce not such good fruit. But see, God works against, quote, nature. He took wild olive branches, you and me, grafted them into His perfect, wonderful tree, Abraham, and we are now producing the fruits of Abraham because of the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's no, there's no boasting over the original branches that have been cut off because of unbelief. And in addition to that, there's no birthright in the kingdom. Everyone comes through faith in Christ, in Christ alone. That's God's grace. And I think that's part of what Paul is challenging the church with. Don't come become complacent, think you've got this. That's exactly what happened to Israel. They got this. So there are a couple of things that I want to emphasize as we close today. Two points. The first one I think is very important. 
that Paul has been teaching us throughout Romans, but he brings it up again today. And that is the olive tree represents the church. And it's comprised of all who are saved by grace through faith in Christ, both Jew and Gentile. The olive tree, Abraham's tree, is made up of all who believe. The branches that were cut off and thrown away are no longer a part of the tree, and we've been grafted into the tree. That's a principle that we need to always remember. And I know there are those segments of Christianity that say that the Jews have a special place that's better than ours. God has a special place for them, but it isn't different from our place. We are adopted children of God with full rights and full standing. The second point that I think we need to walk away from is God is both kind and severe. He is kind to those who believe and follow Him, and He's severe to those who do not believe and rebel against Him. I was reminded when I was studying this week of C.S. Lewis's Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. How many of you are familiar with Aslan? The great lion Aslan was a gentle beast to the small child. Remember that? How Lucy, you know, just went up and could hug his mane and pet him, and he just, he was just the gentle giant. But his roar shook the whole land of Narnia. What a beautiful picture of our God. He is our great lion that loves and protects us. And He's the conquering lion, the lion of Judah, who when He comes back will destroy the world. Both are true. i reminded of Jesus having the little children come around Him. And you see pictures of that. There was one here in the church for years. I think it finally got dilapidated and we took it down. But Jesus with a lamb or with children around Him. But you don't see very many pictures in the church of Jesus coming back with a flaming sword coming out of His mouth riding a war horse to conquer. You see, both are true of our God. And both the kindness and severity of God came together at the cross. God's kindness of Jesus coming and dying on the cross for you and me. That was God's kindness. But it was severity of punishing His Son. Where He died the worst of deaths to take the punishment for that sin. God is both kind and severe. But He's kind to all who believe and trust. We do not have to fear Aslan. We do not have to fear our great King. We can go up and put our arms around His mane and He will love on us because our sins have been taken away. If you would come forward and let's take communion together and we will close our sermon. off here this morning but I want to make full circle back to our benediction. One of the primary purposes of the teaching, I think, of Romans 9, 10, and 11 is found in this passage that ended Romans 8 and the teaching up to that point. And that is the kindness of God is there forever for us because of Christ not because of what we do. And I think that's so important that we are not responsible for getting ourselves to heaven. We're trusting in another to take care of everything here, every moment of every day, and throughout eternity. And I think that's so important as we look at how we live.
Do we exhibit that in our lives every day when we go out there? Are we anxious about finances? Are we anxious about uh, rain? Are we anxious about whether our hay is going to get in? Are we anxious about what's going on in the political arena? Were we anxious, anxious, anxious? Do we worry, 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 worry? If we do, are we really trusting? Because I don't think you can do both. And how we live should be an exhibit to the world that they want what we have. Because we've got it. We've got it all. And do we live content? Or are we chasing after everything the world's chasing after? You see, I think that Paul is challenging the church as he's talking about Israel. Again, what was one of the reasons that Israel failed as a nation? They quit keeping the Sabbath. They were too busy trying to get their crops in. They quit tithing. They quit trusting in God and became self-reliant. We've got this now. We don't need God. And again, there's a warning there for us that if we truly, truly believe that everything is taken care of and we're secure, we live differently. And I think that's what Paul is challenging the Gentile church to live that as an example, not just to the Jews, but to everyone. That we don't live in anxiety. We don't worry. We walk in joy and peace, regardless of the circumstances. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, not by our strength, but His. And that's all accomplished because of the cross. And that's why Jesus reminds us of what He did for us. He said, I died, representing the bread, so that you would have life, have it abundantly, and have it forever. Let's eat. And again, the miracle of the grafted tree. The miracle that we have been grafted into God's forever tree as His family. We are the family tree of God. This tree. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You for Your wonderful promises that You remind us of throughout Your Word. And Lord, help us to take heed to the warnings that you give us to not fall away because of unbelief. Help us to live lives of faith that become a bright, shining light in a world that is anxious, that is angry, that is lost, and does not know its way. And help us to be faithful to both live and communicate the hope we have in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and close with our benediction and we'll be dismissed this morning. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you. Have a great week. Oh, there's a meeting of moms in prayer here at 1 o'clock.